We have Russell Blackford here, who's um, got multiple PhDs and degrees. He's done everything from bioethics to um, he's an attorney as well, so he studied law. Um, I think he's, he's studied social science as well. He's um, editor in chief of the Journal of Evolutionary Technology. Journal of Evolutionary Technology. And yeah. Technology at um, IWET, and there's also a, a fellow there that contributes regularly to the IWET website. Um, and speaks at number of numbers of conferences. Uh, he's got a, a, I think a doctorate in philosophy as well. The list goes on. Russell Blackford will be speaking uh, about surviving beyond the flesh. In fact, the title of the talk is Survival Beyond the Flesh. I'll hand you over to Russell Blackford. Thank you, Adam. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. I hope the sound check is still working on this. Um, look, I'm going to be talking about a very familiar topic and a topic on which it is very difficult to make headway. I'm sure many of you have thought about the topic that, that comes up today. It's very controversial. A lot of people have contradictory intuitions about it. And it's a topic that can break down into people simply agreeing to disagree about their intuitions. Whether I will succeed in making any headway remains to be seen. Right? I'm going to do my best to add value to a very difficult, very slippery philosophical conversation about what, it, what would count you know, as surviving you know, beyond the, you know, this, this animal that speaks before you, this human animal, this specimen of the subspecies Homo sapiens sapiens. Think of this, I'm sure many of you are science fiction readers, think of this in terms of, of science fiction. Take William Gibson's famous story, The Winter Market. Uh, those of you who know that story, published in the mid-1980s, will recall that one character has her personality and consciousness transferred or perhaps been reduplicated to or on you know, an advanced computational substrate, you know, some complex futuristic computer. And the, the narrator who is concerned about this and has interacted with that character says, among other things, if she calls me, is it her? Uh, her in, in italics. There are many other science fiction stories that have, have dealt with this sort of thing. Arthur C. Clarke has doubtless dealt with it going back for decades. Another example well known to many people who um, read science fiction is the Greg Egan story of Dust, where there's a character, Paul Durham, that, you know, the character that we seem to be reading about seems to be a kind of electronic simulation of Paul Durham you know, in cyberspace, though it does eventually turn out that it's the, you know, the real, in inverted commas, Paul Durham, who has been made to think that it is the simulation in cyberspace. But the concern is that we do seem to think that there is a difference. You know, we, we seem to think that it actually matters whether we are dealing with the, in inverted commas, real Paul Durham or the simulation. Now, the question that arises, of course, is, is that a genuine distinction? In what circumstances you know, can we make that distinction? And that's more importantly, in what circumstances can we blur that distinction so that some kind of survival in cyberspace or virtual reality or in a robotic body, whatever it may be, some kind of survival beyond the flesh is genuinely survival. So when you ask the question, when, you know, when Russell talks to me, is it him? And the Russell we're talking about is not a fleshly Russell, this particular human animal, this particular specimen of the subspecies Homo sapiens sapiens. Well, in what circumstances, yeah, is it really me? That's the question that I'm asking today. And as I say, it's a very slippery question. I don't believe there's a clear answer. I'm not going to leave you with a clear answer. I'm going to help you, you know, do some further thinking because I'm sure that the sort of people who come to this conference would have thought about this question. As I said at the start, I hope to add value to your thinking. Whether I succeed in even that remains to be seen. But we will go through this. I'll, I'll try to add value. I'll try to provide some tools for thought. But I guarantee that I will not solve the problem. And we'll see how we go. Now, a confession that I will make right at the outset is I'm going to do something that I don't normally do, and that is I'm going to lean very, very heavily on a written text. I hate people who turn up 
at conferences with a written text and they, they sort of look at it down here and they read it like this. Very boring. And I, I normally avoid that as much as I can. I will avoid it as much as I can today, but this is very slippery stuff. And so I am going to have to depend on my written text more than I normally want to do because it's important to get some of this right, to try to nail down some of the arguments as precisely as possible if there's to be any hope at all of adding value to the existing arguments and make progress, right? So I, I'm afraid I, I have to apologise. I normally think PowerPoint's the devil. I still think PowerPoint's the devil, but I normally just talk. Now, without the context, today I will need to lean upon it to some extent, so forgive me for that in advance. Why might we care about surviving beyond the flesh? Why might we want to survive in some kind of non-biological body or whatever it might be? I take it the reasons why we might want that relate to a wish to have survive longer than our normal mortal lives, a normal 80 years or so that we might expect you know, in our contemporary Western society. <coughs> you know, the idea might be that if I could somehow you know, upload myself into some non-fleshly form, that that might be more durable than this, you know, this, this animal body, this human body. It might even be that if I could survive one transition, that I could go along with transition after transition, you know, successive uh, non-biological substrates, thus gaining a kind of biological immortality. So that might be one reason simply to have much longer life. Another reason might be enhancement of, well, my cognitive capacities, perhaps I might be able to think much faster, you know, with much greater cognitive you know, abilities if I move to some other kind of substrate where that's more under our control. It might even be that I could be uploaded into something that, you know, takes on a, some sort of robotic, I suppose, body that might have greater you know, physical and perceptual capacities. So there might be things that I could look forward to if I could survive beyond you know, this animal, this human animal, this you know, specimen. I, I take it that that's our reason. Now there might be other reasons, I suppose. I might just like the idea that after I'm gone, after I've shuffled off my mortal coil, there will be a being psychologically much likely left in the world, perhaps to get on with some of my projects, or perhaps it's just nice that there's a being something like me left in the world. But I take it that that would only be a consolation prize. The real prize we want is to be able to look forward to this longer life, these enhanced capacities, and so on. Right? Am I right? Is that why we might like it? I look around the room as whether people are nodding along or whether people think that it's a crazy idea and we just won't do it for some other reason, but that's I haven't thought of. Well, all right. People seem to be nodding along. So the real prize is that I am the gain advantages of this uploading, as we call it, and so there's some, some sense in which the, the new me is actually me, or at least there's some sense in which I've actually survived. Or something like that, we need some kind of concept of personal identity being retained or of survival taking place or something of that kind that gives it to me, gives, gives, gives me these things that I can look forward to. Makes sense so far. If we haven't got those things but we've merely created some sort of psychological duplicate or even a physical duplicate, at the most some sort of consolation prize has been received. We've not gained the real prize. That's what I'm going to be assuming. So let's think of the problem initially in the terms that are traditionally applied, the terms of personal identity. Now, is this thing that exists after I have been uploaded onto an advanced computational system, me? Is it identical to me? Is personal identity retained or is it a duplicate? Um, if I call you on the phone, as I said before, is it me? Not everyone wants to talk in those terms. I'm not sure that those are the best terms to talk in. Uh, if I had one PowerPoint slide, we'd just really put up my name, the name of a philosopher called Derek Parford. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this um, well-known philosopher, uh, P-A-R-F-I-T. He says that we should not actually think in terms of identity, we should just think in terms of survival. So we, we might kick around those different ideas. 
Now, why might we not like the term identity here? Why might we prefer to think about survival, which may not necessarily involve identity, but we at least want something such that I can look forward to getting the real prize, right? Whether it's identity or survival or some other phrase, I want to be able to look forward to getting the real prize, not just to there being something in the world after my mortal coil has been shuffled off that is psychologically similar to me. That, I take it, is what we all want. Um, this alternative way of putting it, the path that you this idea that we talk about survival rather than about identity is motivated by a number of things that Parfit considers. I mean, one of those things is the, you know, the sort of science fictional possibility, hey, there's all science fictional possibilities, that I could survive as, as two people, that there could be some sort of you know, fission <coughs> of personalities, or perhaps in some sort of fusion of personalities. Now, I don't know how much weight to put on that idea. Nothing I'm going to be arguing today turns on that idea. But you could imagine, for example, that you know, there, there could be some kind of situation in which you know, one cerebral hemisphere from my brain is moved to you know, one cloned body, let's say, and the other is moved to another, and I have survived those both. Because there have been cases where but for one medical reason or another, it's been necessary to remove an entire cerebral hemisphere. And we, we tend to think, rightly or wrongly, that the person with just the one cerebral hemisphere left in their body has survived. Now, if that's the case, why could it not be that you could have you know, the two cerebral hemispheres separated into you know, appropriate bodies and you survive as both? I can't quite get my head around that. I don't know whether that does not matter surviving as, as two. But you know, Parfit contemplates that sort of possibility, and I suppose the possibility that at least some sort of creature could start off as two and become one, right? So Parfit thinks that what we really care about is not necessarily something that's one-to-one, -one, whereas the idea of identity does seem one-to-one. -one. We normally think that if A is identical to, uh, to, to B, and if A is also identical to C, then B must be identical to C, okay? Identity is, you know, is transitive in that way. You know, Parfit imagines these cases where we might think that someone has survived and got whatever it is that we're trying to achieve, this being able to look forward to, you know, to the, the enhancement, the immortality, etc. And yet, it doesn't look like we want to talk about identity. <coughs> so that's one reason why maybe identity is not the right terminology. I only say this because I don't want to be you know, tied down to any particular terminology. I'd like to get a little bit beyond the question of, yeah, is it really me? Well, yeah, maybe that's not the point. The point more deeply is just, can I actually look forward to these experiences? Or do I just get a consolation prize? So yeah, maybe that advances it a little bit, but there's still a question, well, in what cases do we you know, get more than the consolation prize? Now Parfit thinks that what actually matters, I'm, I'm going to skip over a few ideas here, um, let, let's just pin down Parfit for a moment, the idea of survival. He thinks that what actually matters in survival really is two things. One is an idea of psychological continuity. And the other is an idea of what he calls psychological connectedness. So, what do we mean by that? Well, the idea of psychological continuity is just this, something like the idea that, you know, Russell at 20, me at 20, Russell at 20, was a kind of continuation of Russell at 10. Okay? Uh, Russell at 30 was a kind of continuation of Russell at 20. Russell at 40 is a kind of continuation of Russell at 30. Russell now is you know, a kind of continuation of, of Russell at 40. Now there's this idea that there's a sort of causal order going on over time. Uh, causal processes are taking place within me and acting upon me. And you can see this, you know, this stream going through. Looked at in you know, different terms, you could say, here's Russell 
uh, you can imagine you know, this animal here as a kind of four-dimensional spatio-temporal world, you know, going through through time. You can draw me on a you know, Minkowski diagram or something uh, over time. There's a continuous process going. That, that's one thing that Harford identifies in survival. And you can see how that could apply to a four-dimensional world that's actually bifurcating. So, you know, it allows for fission. So that's why Harford might think that it's a more powerful model to use than a model of identity. The other thing that he thinks is important, and he thinks it's actually more important, is the idea of connectedness. Now, connectedness is not uh, continuity in that sense. Connectedness is like this. If you take Russell at 10 and Russell at 20 and directly compare each other, they get what's in the middle, they bear some resemblance to each other. And if you take Russell at you know, 30 and compare Russell at 20, or take Russell at 40 and compare Russell at 30, they actually resemble each other if you do that direct comparison. They have similar motives, perhaps. Uh, there are memories that they share in common. Uh, there are you know, various you know, attitudes and intentions. There are psychological resemblances. Now, you can see if you put an emphasis on that idea, the survival is going to be a matter of degree. So part of thinks it's not just uh, something other than necessarily one-to-one, -one, but he thinks it's not all or nothing, it's a matter of degree. So you might say that Russell at 10 has not survived to a very high degree by right now, because Russell now yeah, probably doesn't have um, many of the same intentions, attitudes and so on as Russell at 10. And while I may have a lot of Russell at 10's memories, I'll have lost a lot of them, and I have a lot of memories that Russell at 10 didn't have, so when we do that direct comparison, uh, you might say that Russell at 10 has survived only to some degree. Now, if you buy into all of that, you, you might even think that Russell at 10 is not going to survive very much at all by the time you know, I actually turn, say, 80. And that raises all kinds of questions, moral questions and all sorts of things. So, so that's part of it for you. I just introduced those ideas you know, for, for interest to see if they take us any further for those who are not you know, kind of familiar with them. I'm not particularly going to rely upon Harvard. Uh, and I said at the start, I don't have the answer to these questions. The most I can do is add value to the discussion. I don't believe anyone who claims that answers these questions, you know, really does. I, I think if I turned up here and I claimed that the answer, I would really not know what I'm talking about quite literally. Um, yeah, some people have clear answers. I think part has a reasonably clear theory. But it's not a theory that I find all that attractive. I mean, I don't think this connectedness idea is what, um, is what we most care about. I think it's pretty clear that on our ordinary commonsensical point, you know, viewpoint, our ordinary commonsensical criteria, whatever they are, if we try to nail them down, I just have survived for the last ever many years of was since I was 10. So many years I can't remember now, but yeah, I just have survived. But, you know, if you're attracted to Parfit's view, it will take you in some interesting directions because it suggests that, you know, by the time, if you're 30 or 40 now, by the time you're 90, uh, it may not be you very much anymore in any event, and maybe you shouldn't worry too much about things like dying at 90. You know, forget about the whole thing. You know, forget about immortality, because you know, we never live to 90 anyway, if we're 30 or 40 or 50 or whatever we might be, even <coughs> now. So I throw that out there for what it's worth. But now I want to focus in more closely on where I hope I can add some value to, or to the discussion that we're all having. And here is where I think I will have to cling a bit more tightly to my written text because, text because this does get slippery. So, let's just suppose that my brain and other relevant parts of my body, perhaps, you know, much of my nervous system or all of my nervous system, have been non-destructively scanned by some super technological device. So imagine that, you know, a common thought experiment turns up in science fiction, turns up among philosophers, we're discussing these issues of personal identity, or whatever you want to call them. And let us imagine that that enables a super scientist to create you know, a Greg Egan style copy of me, like the copy of Paul Durham. Okay? That, that, non, that, that um, process of non destructive scanning takes place, and the copy is created, and the copy will live in some sort of virtual reality. 
Now, because my brain and the rest of my body have not been destroyed or even damaged by the processes of non-destructive scanning, the original specimen of the subspecies Homo sapiens sapiens that you see before you, talking to you, that does actually you know, continue to exist. It continues to experience pleasures and pains, hopes and fears and so on. You know, as Stella would say, you know, the body kind of continues on. I like the way I talked about the body. You know, the body was a suspended being. Oh, I was suspended and, it was, and I've heard a lot. The body continues on having experiences however pleasurable or painful. Okay, there are now two conscious beings with similar psychological makeup existing in the world. They have the same apparent memories and so on. Question whether they are genuine memories, that's, that could be a big <coughs> few questions, but they at least seem to remember the same things, they have similar psychological makeup. And if we go with Parthet and we don't think of identity as one to one, and we think of something other than identity as being what's at stake here, we might be able to agree that both the ongoing human animal and the copy uh, you know, in some sense, they are both the original me prior to the scan. That's a, a fission process has taken place. <coughs> uh, that seems like an odd thing to say that they're both me because they're not identical to each other and they go on diverging. You know, the Parker, of course, can deal with that by saying that I, prior to the scan, Russell, prior to the scan, survives as both. Right? That's, the, that's Parker's account. But do I survive as both? I'm going to sharpen up that question um, using a thought experiment borrowed with appropriate changes, quite a lot of changes actually, from a philosopher called Bernard Williams, the late Bernard Williams. Um, so, suppose prior to the non-destructive scanning process, here I am, I'm about to be put in the scanner, which won't you know, destroy me, prior to the non-destructive scanning process, I'm told that the copy will be horribly tortured. The super scientist that's doing all this is actually a mad super scientist, right? This, this mad super scientist is going to torture the copy horribly. Now, I may be appalled to hear that. I may be appalled at the idea of anybody being and I believe that this copy will be you know, capable of feeling pain and it's always pleasure and so on. So I'm horrified at that situation. But what I want to ask you is, should I fear being tortured? Here I am, the, the human specimen of the subspecies Homo sapiens sapiens, that to be non-destructively scanned, I'm told the copy will be horribly tortured. I fear perhaps for the copy, right? But should I fear being tortured after all this takes place? Now, some people are shaking their heads, some people are nodding. Intuitions are dividing here. I mean, my intuition is I should not fear being tortured. I should be appalled at what the mad super scientist is going to do. You know, the man's super scientist is going through pain and suffering, someone's going to suffer, it's going to be terrible, if it's, a, you know, it's bad that that should happen. But I mean, my pretty strong intuition is that I should not fear being tortured, I should fear for this other entity that will be created, and I should be appalled at what will happen, and I should make a moral judgment against the man super scientist, but I should not actually fear being tortured. Now, if you go along with that intuition, it takes you down a certain path. If you don't go along with it, it's going to take you down a different path from mine. But say we go down my path, and the path of the people who are shaking their heads in the audience. If I do not fear being tortured in that situation, it seems by process of symmetrical reasoning that I also cannot look forward to the pleasures that a copy will experience if Instead of being told, yeah, the copy will be tortured, I was told the copy will be you know, put through certain processes that will give the copy great pleasure. And if that's the case, I cannot look forward to whatever you know, benefits uh, I would gain if I were the copy. You know, if the copy is potentially mortal and the animal is not, you know, it seems that if I've got down the path of not fearing torture, 
And that's not so great down the path of saying, I only get the consolation prize. I only get the prize that something very like me will continue to exist in all. Perhaps after I've shuffled off my mortal coil. I get the consolation <coughs> prize, but I don't get the real prize. <coughs> now, I've had answers to you. I've told you my intuition. You have had different intuitions. Some people shook their heads and some people nodded. I can't really tell you what intuition you must have. I don't believe that there is any way that I can go back to some uncontroversial assumptions and then prove by a process of deductive logical steps that you must come out one way or the other on this. That's why I think I can help you think about it maybe. I can maybe add some value to the discussion, but I can't really prove one way or the other how you should think. You're going to have to think about, well, Whatever your criteria are, they're probably pretty vague and co um, You know, they may not be transparent to you, but whatever they are, how do they lead you to an intuition on a question like, like that? But my intuition is that I should not be being tortured, and it's not even a situation where I might go with Parfit and say, look, I survived to a greater degree this thing that's exactly like me, uh, but also to some degree in the problem. It just doesn't seem like that. It seems to me that I just do survive like 100% in the animal. You know, the copy is a psychological duplicate. I should be unhappy for the copy. I should be unhappy about what the mad scientist is doing, but I should not actually fear this happening to, to me. That's my intuition. Now, I've said, you know, some of you do disagree with that judgment. And, you know, I, I can't force you to agree with the judgment. But what I do say is if you have the same, you know, admittedly vague, tacit, perhaps not self-transparent, you know, inchoate standards that I'm applying, um, then you've got to say, that you cannot imagine yourself having experiences to look forward to in the copy any more than you fear the experiences of the copy. Now, my standards for survival you know, may be very difficult to define in any coherent way. They may not be correct. They may not end up being coherent if we try to make them out against the degree. I haven't tried to argue for them from first principles. Perhaps the self is an illusion anyway, as the Buddhists say. Perhaps our know, personal identity and survival are illusions. But at first blush, you know, these vague inchoate has to, perhaps not transparent to me myself, standards, do seem to serve me well enough, and they make it difficult for me to escape the sense that the human animal in these various situations is the real me, and that the copy is a kind of psychological duplicate, and that that won't change, even if the copy were not going to exist in cyberspace or virtual reality, but were put into, you know, the copy should have talked to you, obviously. <laughs> but were put into some sort of robotic body. You know, imagine that happened. I don't say that changes anything about the thought experiment. The, the copy in the, you know, perhaps cognitively superior, physically superior body may have all the enjoyment of those superior capacities, may revel in them, but merely changing the thought experiment in that way does not mean that I can look forward to reveling in those <coughs> superior capacities. Okay? So let's rub the point in even a little bit further. What if after I'm undestructively scanned 500 copies of A, and I'm told beforehand that they will all be tortured, but that my ongoing human body will not be. Now that's a horrible scenario. 500 people and not just 500 people. I'm not pushing this up. You know, it says people. Uh, they're all going to be tortured. That's appalling. So I'm appalled when I'm told this, but do I fear it happening to me? Now I might be, I might fear that something terrible will happen, as I might fear that many people will starve tomorrow in sub-Saharan Africa. But do I fear it in the sense of yeah, expecting to experience this terrible thing myself? It seems like you know, the fact that it's a larger number makes no difference whatsoever. Okay? Now, let's move it along a bit. What if it's exactly the same scenario, uh, but 
my brain and other relevant parts of my body this time are scanned destructively. And once again, <coughs> you know, a copy will be made using the data that's obtained, and that copy may initially live in a virtual reality, it may at some later stage be given a robot body as we've discussed, and say I'm told, I'm, you know, I'm told that this human animal will be destroyed by the process of scanning, of destructive scanning, and I'm also told that the copy will be tortured. On this scenario, should I fear being tortured at some time in the near future? <coughs> well, I don't see how anything's changed. It looks to me as if something appalling is going to happen to the copy. Now, it's appalling that this sentient conscious being is going to suffer this pain and so on. That's terrible. <coughs> Uh, just as it was in the non-destructive scanning scenario, terrible things going to happen and I should be morally outraged, but, you know, as well as it was just very undesirable that this happened. Um, but it seems that the torture of the copy, the pulling out maybe is not something that I should fear in the normal sense. It's exactly the same as the non-destructive scenario. Now, there is something for me to fear in this scenario, I reckon. I reckon I should fear being killed. Because my body's going to be destroyed, okay? I will be shuffling off my mortal coil in this scenario, but I don't see how I should fear being tortured after that event. It seems that must be the case. If you had the same initial intuition as I did, it, it follows through that whether my body's destroyed or not makes no difference. So maybe you disagreed with me on the initial intuition, but if you actually went along with me, um, well, you know, the fact that this is a destructive process and my original body will not so it makes no difference. That no more gives me the real prize uh, if it were not tortured but rather some pleasant experience. No more gives me the real prize than with the non-destructive scanning situation. And again, even if it were not tortured with some pleasant experience, I am stuck with only the consolation. Now, it's very true, of course, that the copy waking up in virtual reality or in the robot body, if we want to go down the path, <coughs> might have no way of knowing that it is the copy. You know, if it's in virtual reality, it seems to have a body you know, very like mine. Uh, it may have no way of knowing that. Let's assume the virtual reality is very rich in you know, subjective sensual content. But that's not the point. That seems to me in no way to change the fact that I cannot look forward to having the experiences of the copy if those are pleasant experiences. In no way changes the fact that I should not fear being tortured if the man super scientist has told me that the copy after all this takes place is going to be tortured. So, okay, the copy may not know, but that's not the question that I face. The question I face is, you know, do I gain the real prize? if I go ahead with this and assuming what the copy has is not tortured with something good. So the issue, whatever kind of language we want to use, whether it's language of identity or language of survival or some other kind of language, the issue is what experiences I can look forward to having. If a scenario works in such a way that I should not fear something happening to a particular being, a fear in the full sense that we've been talking about, then it appears, as I said, that the symmetry applies. I likewise can't look forward to enjoying experiences that apply to this being. So that's the crux of what I'm, I'm putting to you today. Uh, we can talk about identity, we can talk about survival, but in the end, what I really want, if I'm going to be uploaded, is some confidence that I now can look forward to having the experiences that this computational being will have, including its longer life, its enhanced capacities, and all the rest of it. Now, when you think about whether you, you, know, you want to be uploaded or uploaded by some specific process, that's the question I suggest you need to ask yourself. Uh, it's not enough that something much like you will have a long life, you will revel in its powers, you know, certain enjoyable experiences and so on. Um, that might be a consolation prize, but what you really want to know is whether you can right now look forward to all those things. And a useful way to think about that is to ask yourself whether the prospect of this being suffering 
suffering torture perhaps, is something you fear, in the way that you fear a, th a credible threat of being tortured tomorrow when you wake up. Now, look, none of what I've been saying is meant in any way to deny that there could be circumstances in which you could be uploaded and you could enjoy all the resolving experiences. You know, perhaps you could somehow turn into a computational construct as opposed to being destroyed and replaced by one or having one created an addition to you. Yeah, that's just some scenario I have not yet described that involves this process of turning into. I don't want to you know, sort of deny that possibility. I mean, someone might have put some possibilities to me. There could be scenarios that count as you're being turned into something post-human or something post-biological or even something godlike. But I want to emphasize that this concept of turning into yeah, is, a, is a tricky one. It's not obvious what it means and what counts as that. Yeah, at a minimum, it would seem to require some kind of physical continuity involving change in you know, a complex, <coughs> structured way. It seems that there must be a continuous you know, history and a continuous causal development in which the changes to the particular human animal, the specimen here, you know, certain kinds of outcomes, which we could try to know about what they'd be, um, certain kinds of outcomes of events happening to it, and within it, you know, at various stages in time. You know, not just any old change, of course, is going to do the trick. Um, you know, if a bear turns into a bear skin rug plus a pile of bear meat and bear bones, you know, that kind of turning into is not going to be enough. Right? So I don't want to turn into um, yeah, my skin that's been flayed off many years. I want to turn into something that it's worth turning into. So perhaps there's some concept like that that we could use, um, knowing that there are nonetheless some changes, some turnings into, that involve death, or perhaps some that are as bad as, as death. For example, if I turned into um, you know, something comatose or something with greatly increased <coughs> capacities. Uh, yeah, that, that seems like something very undesirable to turn into. Uh, and in some cases, you know, the dividing line between death and you know, extreme loss of capacities you know, might be quite arbitrary. So I'll leave you with that not so pleasant thought, um, except to repeat that those people who do propose or advocate uploading need to work out situations in which the rest of us are convinced that we really can look forward to the benefits on offer. That it meets <coughs> our, our conception of what it is to look forward to the benefits. We need assurance that the benefits won't merely be enjoyed by a psychologically similar being that stands as a replacement or a, or a duplicate. Um, so, in conclusion, I, look, I hope I've given you some interesting thoughts and tools for thinking further about the issue. I'm happy to hear questions whether or not I can give you any convincing answers, because I said there are no convincing answers, and yeah, thank you.
So there is some point before which I stop thinking. Yeah, there's some point before which I start thinking that's not really something I will attain. I think the point is that whether we believe our self is in the physical body of our head and we move it, or whether the uploading and the data transfer also transfers ourselves. Yeah. The thing is, in the case you gave me, you know, my physical brain is continuing. And I suppose we tend to think that, you know, our, well, I, I'm not sure I like this thing, I think, but, you know, I, I, I describe quickly how it causes all sorts of problems. But, but there's some idea here that if what seems like the most important psychological part of us, which is our brains, <coughs> you know, physically goes on in a continuous way, well, we're more inclined to think that whatever is attached to that can genuinely be you know, looked forward to or feared. I, I'm, I'm going to just extend your thought experiment very briefly uh, in, in a two small, short paces, so please bear with me. Imagine instead of being a uh, virtual uploading process, it was to a highly innovative clone of you, so it's a biological entity. It's your body, the brain is still totally innovative, and the scanning process simply prunes that brain back or adds a few synapses so that that physical copy is now the same as you. So you can see that's analogous to the same virtual upload that you just described, and I presume that you would not fear if it was to be tortured as well. Right? Okay. So let me just get it clear. My brain is this this you know, space-time thing. Non-destructive. I get scanned non-destructively, and the data is then used to alter a biological clone in such a way as to restructure its brain. And then that biological clone over there, say, gets tortured. I'm going to say I'm appalled, but yeah, I don't fear the torturing myself. Correct. Okay. Now, the second part of the thing is that new entity is tortured, experiences the pain, not very happy, and then it's told, hey, we're now going to clone you using the same scanning technique we used before and put you into a third clone. Would that second entity fear? That process. I don't believe it would. Oh. What's your intuition? You, you, so here's Russell, here's Russell A. I've been scanned non destructively. Yes. Russell B is over there. Using the data obtained from the scan, Russell B is altered in such a way as to encode certain, you know, seeing memories and so on. Query, yes. query, 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 real memories. And the Russell data B. from Russell A is then put into Russell C in the same No, no, no. Way. Russell B is now tortured as per the original injunction. Right, right. Russell B feels the pain of the torture. Yep. Then Russell B is told it is now going to go through the same scanning process that Russell A went through, right. and a third entity will be created, Russell C. Yep. Now, surely Russell B, having been tortured, having experienced a causal history back to Russell A, and thinking, oh, that was me, and now I'm here, it will now have learned this ability to transfer, and thus will feel fear. No, I don't see why it would, because that would imply, I don't, I don't see how that follows at all. All that follows is that, you know, Russell B, that's what we already knew, the torture hurts. But Russell B has no reason to think that Russell A suffered. No, no, no. Russell B. Yeah, but, if, but hang on. If Russell B has no reason to think that Russell A suffered pain, then why would Russell B think that yeah, he is going to suffer pain when Russell C is tortured? Because Russell B. The transitivity seems Russell to go the other way from what you're suggesting.
and have no interest in what we contribute uh, and, and what the preservation of whatever we in whatever form we can and what we know and we never got around to actually doing in our lifetime what potential there might be for that so I think you're in a sense you're, you're running a conversation which is highly unproductive um, and that we ought to be thinking much more about what use our time will be to the world and to the future of nature, humanity and everything else that we have intelligence than we are about what our personal journey is like and then this particularly comes when you get to accept yourself as being emerging rather than uh, and, and when you're not quite sure whether the person who wakes up tomorrow morning is really you because these processes you're talking about may be no different to waking up in, in the next morning. Uh, well look there's a couple of points there though. I was, I was waiting up until the very end uh, I mean, the very last thing you said seemed to be saying, well, is it sufficient to stop identity or something when we go to sleep at night? So, and that is an issue, of course. Yeah, you, you, you might... I think our, our kind of tacit vague, inchoate, etc., sense of identity, survival, and so on, is such that we don't count it as not taking place just because we've gone to sleep or perhaps been put under for an operation. Query whether we can coherently say that while saying all the other things I've said. That, that's one issue, uh, but most of what you were saying was that some kind of consolation prize is actually worth getting, and the consolation prize might be, I contribute to the world, you know, it's this, this even if it's only a duplicate that's being created here, and, and I die, uh, what I leave behind might be something that's worth leaving behind to contribute to the wider world, that may well be so. Uh, but what I do say is that at least the way the discussions usually run, that's only a consolation price of people who talk about uploading, are usually wanting to do it because they think it gives them longer life or immortality, etc., etc. But I'm not contributing to that conversation. I don't at all deny that there can be consolations from even an upload process that um, is such that you can't enjoy those things. Um, I'd like to hear your comment actually on, on the, one of the scenarios that you mentioned right at the end is almost a, a throwaway scenario, but I think that's actually the, the, the crux of this conversation, which is the, the concept of a gradual uploading, yeah. where we could imagine, say, uh, a nanomachine that is inserted into our bloodstream, and as a brain cell dies in our brain, it is replaced by a mechanical yeah. replacement that, that performs exactly like the original. Yeah. So over a gradual time as your brain dies off organically, you're replaced by a mechanical substance. That, that can then continue on immortally. So, do you find that solves that problem of consolidation well, consciousness? Right. Look, um, that is a yeah, that's a thought experiment that's often run. Yeah, something you know, just a neuron by neuron replacement. Let's say we've got some sort of artificial thing that does exactly the same sort of job as one of our neurons. We don't quite understand how they work, now, eh? but still, say we do, and we can replace our neurons one by one, and you know, you never know the difference. The inner experience continues. Look, it, it, my intuition on that is that it seems pretty clear that I have turned into this thing. That that is out of neurons. It is a process of turning into. And I'm not really here to say that can't happen. In fact, I mean, I've seen philosophers argue I am in my essence, sort of the hell that means, a human being. And if I cease to be a human being, well, I have ceased to be. I, I think that's rubbish. I, I, I think it's quite possible to imagine some kind of process that by our you know, vague, inchoate, blah, blah, blah uh, standards, it really doesn't amount to turning into you know, a non-biological, post-human thing, or into a god, or into a Jupiter brain, if that's what you want to end up at. I, I don't have any real philosophical problem with that. You know. But that doesn't mean that these issues are unimportant because it might be, for one reason, it might be very difficult to do with the uploading in a way that would meet those criteria, whereas it might be possible to do it in a way that doesn't meet those criteria. It's sometimes said uh, by people who are interested in cryonics, it wasn't said today, but sometimes said by people who are interested in cryonics, that what will most likely happen is that your frozen brain and body yeah, will not be revivable but it will be possible to do some sort of scan which will gain sufficient information that we can then do what was discussed earlier, you know, used information to, you know, to alter the neurology of a clone or something. 
and that that might be good enough for you to be able to look forward to the experiences of the client that's been altered from the information that's been gained from your cryonically preserved body. It says to me that that's not a process that's going to give me anything other than a consolation prize. So you've got to look at actual scenarios where these kinds of issues come up and then look at the actual process and then think, well, you know, is this sort of process that's being described one where, yeah, I'm really going to enjoy the benefits? Um, as you use the word sur surviving a lot, you use yeah. the word fear of torture a lot. I, I actually, in my work, I can invent words. One of the words that I invented is thrival, which is it's about as thrival as an aspirational goal, not survival as an aspirational goal, but thrival, which is rather oh. a better hope. The very, fact I had, the very fact I had invented that word says a lot, a lot, a lot about the lack of loftiness of the aspirations of English speaking people. So let's say I'm thriving mm. rather than surviving, and then think about the, 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 the issues of pleasure and maybe even ecstasy rather than the fear of torture, mm. and and just getting old. Mm. And because the, the disembodied, so I, I, I was thinking of George and I with Gershwin talking about Methuselah living 900 years, but what, uh, who calls that living when no girl will give in to no girl for so no years? Yeah. Yeah, right. and, and so I'm, I'm so if you uh, go to that, that scenario, maybe maybe we should be going for the, the elixir of youth instead, going back the other way. Oh, look, we all want to look forward to more flourishing lives. So I take it that a whole lot of what we're talking about at this conference is you know enhancing our capacities and you know, and, and then and, you know, reveling in that. You know, we, we want to increase our cognitive and perceptual and physical capacities, don't we? And we probably want to thrive in other ways as well, such as having you know, relationships that are satisfying and, and all the rest of it. Absolutely. But we want to make sure that we really can afford to those things, which is my fairly narrow yeah, topic of discussion. Uh, I'm just wondering how reliable you think our intuitions can be in these sorts of areas, because uh, forking and uh, merging of identities mm. and hogging of identities in this way is something that's never been possible before, it's never mm. been done. Mm. Uh, and I think the best analogy you can come up with is uh, quantum physics, mm. in that it's an area completely outside our experience and all our intuitions about it are totally wrong. And until you actually do the experiments and develop the math, then you can't trust what you think is going to happen. Right. Yeah, I did say a few times, because I'm, I'm kind of humbled by this fact, that I can't really prove the intuitions and I can't sort of prove any conclusions. You know, all I can do is try to pump you to apply your, you know, your tacit criteria, those you know, vague tacit criteria. But the trouble is we only ever apply vague tacit criteria. If we push this to its limit, it may be that the self is an illusion. You know, it may be that you don't mm. survive in, you know, in some sense when you go to sleep at night and, and wake up in the morning. But you do have some sort of criteria by which that does count as still being you the next day. Uh, if you're looking forward to you know, tomorrow to some, uh, some good experience, I don't know what it might be, you know, you're going out to dinner with your girlfriend or whatever it might be, right? Uh, it would be very hard for me to convince you that that experience tomorrow is not an experience that you can look forward to enjoying. The mere fact that you don't go to sleep in between is not going to change your mind. So we, you know, we do have tacit criteria, but I can't sort of prove in any absolute way that they're correct. Russell. Yeah. Can I ask you another thought experiment? If instead of being uploaded to a clone body or into a virtual environment, Say you're told you're going to go to sleep soon and the super science is going to make the exact identical copy of you. So identical that no one can tell the difference. Yeah. You won't know with the other copy, they can't tell it mm. with the other copy. And when you wake up, one of you will be tortured. Mm. Now, do you look forward to being tortured or are you not worried? It's a 50-50 chance, surely. Uh, it sounds like, well, well, well assume it goes up 50-50, yeah. Well, it you, you, public, but... you could wake up, at the, the copy could wake up yeah. with the anticipations you've had, or you could wake up with the anticipations you've had. Nobody knows which is which. Yeah, so it's really no different, let me make sure I've got this correct. It's really no different from my initial thought experiment with the non-destructive scanning and the mad scientist, the mad super scientist says, yeah, you'll be okay, but the um, 
you know, the copy, the, the great Ewing type copy, will be tortured. With this difference, the, the super scientist says, um, after the process, I'm going to flip a coin and I'll torture either you or the copy. No, 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 I'm saying there's no way to tell the difference. You start out saying, well, hold on, there's no you way to there's do. not you, and therefore they're not the same. And I'm saying they're, they're identical in every way anyone can measure. It's that good a super science. Well, hang on, do they have the same space uh, temporal location? You don't know which one you have, you've gone to sleep. No, I know, I, I know I don't know. But, but, but prior to the scanning taking place, it seems to me I do know that they will have different space and different locations, for example, right? Sure. Yeah, that they will be different. Uh, the mere fact that it would be impossible for the copy to know that he will be a he, it's it's impossible for the copy, given its environment and so on, to know that it's the copy. I don't think that changes anything. I prior to the scanning know that either yeah, the physical animal will be tortured, or the copy will be tortured, depends on the flip of a coin. I think I should be worried. Right. I should be appalled that it will happen to either, uh, but I have a reason to fear that it will be me. I'd say it's, a, it's exactly the same, because if you if it's an identical copy, if there's no way, if it's a real, genuine, exact copy, then there's a 50% chance you'll wake up with the copy, and you just can't tell. Well, there's no one can tell. Well, there's a 50% chance that the copy will be tortured. Well, you say no one can tell, but the bad scientists can tell, surely. No, no, I'm well, saying... Well, well, but hang on. Exactly. They have a different spatio-temporal location. No, you work out there together. So, I mean, if you're saying that, 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 that they don't have that, then I don't think that is true at all. So uh, the, the mad scientist, at least, must be able to flip that coin and have some criteria. No. Even if it's only the spatial location, so I, so, I, so I can't make that a coherent thought experiment the way I describe it. Well, there must be some scenarios that are quite negative. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I like to think of more of a positive scenario. Um, <laughs> I like to think of the idea of merging. So you, you have a copy, your copy goes off, it does something exciting, you come back and you merge. Would that make this any more attractive technology to you? Or would you think you feel differently about it? So let's take a, the, the copy's going to be created yeah. and at some later stage somehow the ongoing uh, physical animal and the copy will be merged. So you, you have to get memories of your copy. Yeah. Here it's very difficult. I, mean, I know what Harvard's going to say. Harvard's going to think that yeah, survival is taking place here. I mean, I find it very hard with these things. You know, these kinds of scenarios, any of these scenarios, I say this now compared to our ordinary human experience that we've had so far, you know, historically, that it's, it's, it can be quite hard even knowing what intuitions to have. It, it certainly looks, though, even if you're not part of it, as if you have somehow you know, survived or whatever the right terminology is, and you can look forward to experiences of the, you know, the, the merged being at the end. I mean, it looks like that to me. But you can see I get rather shifty about what my intuitions are on some of these scenarios. But that is my intuition. It does seem like I can look forward to whatever experiences that has. So if the that super scientist tells me uh, this will take place, your physical body will go on because the non-destructive scanning, the copy will be created, there's some way that can be merged afterwards. And after all that, the merged people will have all these pleasant experiences. The question is then, can I look forward to those pleasant experiences? It seems that there's a that chance. That, that, that's, not, that that's a kind of intuitive answer that I can't prove. But you share that answer, I take that. Yeah, it, it, it gains skills and knowledge. Yeah, that, that yeah. seems like I can look forward to that. Yeah. And it does seem that the mad scientist said, well, the merged people will be tortured. That seems like a reason to fear that. Yeah. That's, that's the, uh, 